Welcome to the Procure Conference about prostate cancer and uh, recurrence of this cancer. We would like to thank all of the participants in this room and uh, thank you. This is uh, both a French and English conference available on the internet on the procure.ca website. We'd also like to thank our speaker. Thank you for taking the time to share his knowledge with us. Dr. Frédéric Pouliot is with us. He is a urologist and oncologist working in the hospital center, university related to the university. We want to thank our sponsors, all the Johnson. Thank you to our sponsors that make this possible. A few reminders before we start. So all along the conference, we invite you to uh, take notes of your questions. There's going to be a Q&A session after the presentation by our speaker. Those that are attending through the internet, you can ask questions questions both in English or in French by clicking on the button which says uh, ask a question. So if you allow me, I'm going to take three minutes to introduce Procure. Il est avec notre notre organisme. So first of all, we would like to tell you that we support every Quebecer. Every day, 12 uh, Quebecers uh, get a prostate cancer um, notice, notification. This is why Procure was created in order to uh, be a force against this disease. And so we have one single mission, three axes of intervention research. We want to make people aware. We want to provide also information and support. Regarding research, we are talking about our bio bank, which is thanks to many Quebecers that have given bio samples. Maybe that some of you are being monitored through this uh, bio bank of Procure here at our research center. We think that this is the best uh, example of uh, helping out and making things better for the collectivity. This allows us to uh, invest more, seven, uh, more than $7 million in terms of research, and then we can see if a man receives a diagnosis versus another man that receives the same diagnosis, same age, same stage. Why does one has a recurrence and the other one doesn't have any recurrence of uh, cancer? This is one of the research projects that we are doing through our biobank. Regarding the, well, uh, awareness, as you know, November uh, 19 is going to be the Quebec Day of P Prostate Cancer Awareness. So we ask everybody to uh, wear this uh, little tie so that everybody can uh, be part for every dollar. We give 80 cents to this cause, and uh, 80 cents is is for this Procure Bio Bank. Regarding the uh, information and support, well, uh, these types of conferences as of, as of today is part of this. We have our website, we have our blog, we have our uh, brochures, leaflets, we have our programs uh, in uh, businesses, also programs with medical doctors, family doctors, all of this is part of the support uh, program and information program, you will hear more and more about Procure, and we are going to make sure our website will become uh, available, and our a new website is uh, really uh, great, by the way. And we have a toll-free phone line, maybe that you've already spoken to one of our nurses specialized in oncology, so please don't hesitate to call them. They're there to answer your, to your questions. Uh, you can have two appointments, uh, so please take advantage of this, and then the answers will be uh, sent uh, within 24 hours. This is a very positive program which gives a lot of uh, moral support to every caller, whether you are a patient, spouse, member of the family, colleague. We are there to support each and every one of you. Mm -hmm. 
Now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Frédéric Pouliot. As I've said before, he is a, a, a doctor, a urologist and oncologist. He is working here at Laval University. He also works with the University Hospital Center of Quebec City. I'd like to invite him. He's going to do this conference, which I've seen already. It's quite an exceptional conference, and it should answer to many of your questions and concerns. Dr. Pouliot, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Boschman. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you this evening in order to discuss this topic of prostate cancer. Today, we're going to talk about uh, what to do after a recurrence of a primary treatment. Thank you for attending in order to uh, be able to discuss this stage of the disease. And also, wel welcome to everybody which are online. We have about 100 people online which were registered, and we can answer questions here, but also through the web. Tonight, we talked about the recurrence of prostate cancer uh, after treatment, whether it's by radiation therapy or surgery. We're going to discuss uh, how you can control this, what are the treatments, what can you do with these patients which have a recurrence locally or at a distance. We often hear about prostate cancer at different stages, early stages. Uh, should you uh, do screening or not once you've diagnosed it? What should you do? Should you do active monitoring, surgery, or radiation therapy? This evening, we're going to talk about another stage of the uh, disease. You have a patient which has its local treatment and diagnosis, and then most of them are going to have a PSA, a good answer to the treatment, but a percentage of these uh, patients are going to have a recurrence, and there are several options for our patients. We're going to discuss all of this. Before we talk about recurrence as such, let's remind the anatomy uh, to really understand this prostate cancer and its recurrence. Prostate is an exocrine gland. Uh, exocrine gland is located right between the bladder and between the urethra uh, 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 in the penis. And at the back, you have the rectum. Now, you have these erectile uh, nerves that go through the prostate. And this is why the treatment associated to this cancer can be related to a lack of uh, erection. Here you have this little muscle, the external sphincter here, which is going to allow con uh, to uh, contain uh, uh, so the liquids, and so you're going to see that there are two main treatments, surgery or uh, radiotherapy, and there are adverse conditions sometimes. Something else is the PSA, which stands for prostate-specific antigen. PSA is secreted by the uh, prostate in sperm in this exocrine gland. It's going to use uh, for the liquefaction, liquefaction of uh, sperm uh, during ejaculation. So prostate cancer is the most frequently di diagnosed cancer across Canada. There's one man out of seven in during his life that will be diagnosed with this cancer. It represents about 10% of the mortality rates of Canada, one man out of 27. In Quebec, we diagnose 12 men every day with this uh, prostate cancer. This is 4,800 Quebecers every year, and 880 of them will die of prostate cancer. Often we hear talk that uh, prostate cancer is a disease without a pain. But these uh, stats, we remember that, yes, many uh, patients won't die if they get a diagnosis of prostate cancer, but still, this is still a high level of mortality. So all along this presentation, I'm going to give you some key messages, and I think that this is what we have to focus. So uh, here's the first one. Prostate cancer is the most common a cancer among men, the highest cause, case, uh, cause of mortality in Quebec and Canada. Now, the second key message is that the majority of diagnosed patients will not necessarily die of their cancer when they are treated. And the question you might ask at this stage is, so is it worthwhile to uh, treat prostate cancer? 
is it worthwhile to have uh, surgery or um, radiotherapy? The answer is yes. There have been several studies. Here's one, a study where we have looked some patients with uh, prostate cancer. And if you do the follow-up, if you treat them with a radical uh, prostatectomy, is there going to be a difference in the rate of mortality? Well, what you see here is that you have the y-axis. You see the probability of death of cancer and the years. In black, you see that there's less chance of dying when you're going to do a radical prostatectomy uh, rather than just watchful waiting. And the difference is higher when you are interested in the case of mortality by prostate cancer. And there are other studies which have shown the same thing. However, what's interesting to know is that all of these uh, cancers are the same. Some are high-risk cancers that are going to be uh, very slow in their evolution. And today, we even doubt that they're going to be a cause of mortality on the long term. Today, these cancers uh, are just going to be uh, monitored. Others uh, have an intermediate level of risks. These are cancers that are going to uh, to, to have a risk of dying in the patient after 10, 15 years, but locally the chances of curing are very good. And the third category are high-risk cancers. These are cancers which are more aggressive, and even though you treat them with surgery or radiation therapy, many of them are going to recur and might create the death of the patient. So how uh, do you discriminate between all these uh, types of cancers? There are three elements you need to know. The first, first one to know is the rectal touch. Can you touch it, feel it? The second one is the level of PSA at diagnosis. And the third one is the Gleason total, score of Gleason. What is the score of Gleason? This is the aggressivity level of cancer. How is your potential of malignancy? Can the cancer progress? So the pathologist will give you the Gleason score. When you get the biopsy, you send it to the pathologist. The pathologist looks into the microscope according to the morphology of cells. It will tell you if these are very aggressive or non-aggressive cells. You have these porous cancer cells. They have a score of Gleason of 6. Those of intermediate uh, risk have a Gleason score of 7. And those of very high risk, very aggressive, have a Gleason score of 8, 9, and 10. And when you take then the rectal touch, which is the clinical stage here, uh, one uh, CT1C and the Gleason score, uh, APS as well, you can determine the risk of cancer among a patient. And then you can determine what is the risk of dying of cancer. So here you have a graph of the three risk levels of prostate cancer after a radiation therapy. This is the number of years and the number of dead patients. In red, these patients at high risk are going to die at a higher rate than those patients that have a cancer with a low risk of cancer. This very low level of mortality now that means that we should have an active uh, monitoring. Not many of them are going to die after 15 years without much intervention. Now, the third message this evening is that prostate cancers don't have the same level of aggressiveness. Often we hear patients telling us, I have a friend, he had prostate cancer, and he had a radical prostatectomy. He never uh, had a recurrence. I want the same thing. Another will say, I have a friend, he had radiotherapy, and he had a recurrence. So I don't want to have this radiation therapy. So often it's not the same type of cancer they're talking about. So when you talk about prostate cancer and you do uh, therapeutic choices, you have to understand the risk level of the cancer, low, uh, moderate or high. The fourth message this evening is that the surgery or radiation therapy of prostate cancers of intermediate risk or high risk, this reduces the mortality level. Many studies have shown this. Now, let's get into the heart of this topic, which is the detection and treatment after primary first line treatment. So how can you monitor cancer? You've treated the patient, it has its radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy. How do you know if cancer was totally eradicated or it might reoccur? There are three uh, things to monitor. First, uh, PSA, the prostate specific antigen, you just take a blood sample. Then you look if there is um, uh, 
a tumor, uh, you also look if there are new urinary symptoms, then you might see that the cancer is uh, progressing. You're also going to use some x-rays or imaging, conventional imaging, such as um, bone scintillography or other types of scans. Then you might say this is a biochemical. Uh, recurrence because it's in the blood. If the patient has pain or symptoms, you're going to talk about a progression which is a clinical progression. If the patient has the uh, appearance of metastasis, you're going to talk about a radiological progression. So we are going to see what types, what you can do about these different stages with all of these types of symptoms. Now let's go back to the a prostatic specific antigen. As I've said before, this is a protein which is secreted by prostate to liquefy sperm, which is present only in prostate organ. Its elevation is not, its high level is not a diagnosis of cancer. There are other pathologies which might also explain its high level, if it is of high level. Once you've done the local treatment, you monitor the APS, and I was saying in the majority of cases, you're going to have an PSA, rather PSA, which is going to be at zero after the radical prostatectomy. But then if you see that uh, PSA will go up once again, this is a sign that there will still might be some disease which might uh, be recurring. So once you've had the first line treatment, you're going to dose the PSA. You're going to do it every three months first for two years, then every six months, and then after five years, once a year here during 10, 15 years to make sure there's no uh, other recurrence. And then you are going to uh, look at the PSA, uh, its uh, speed of change. If it increases, you're going to know if it recur recurs or not. And one of the major questions uh, that I get from a patient who has a recurrence of PSA, the, end, the question is, doctor, why do you measure uh, PSA? I don't have a prostate anymore. You removed it. You need to know that these normal cells of the prostate are going to secrete some PSA, but cancer cells as well. So we assume as doctors that when the prostate is uh, with some PSA, even you don't have um, prostate anymore, you might have some cancer cells that might go into the bones, into the bladder, or into other organs such as the liver. Cancer cells also might go back to the location of the treatment such as surgery or radiation therapy. They might go back to prostate in surgery. They might go back to the surrounding area of uh, recurrence. Now. As a clinician also, or as a patient, as somebody interested by this type of cancer, it's important for you to understand when you have a PSA uh, after a treatment, radical prostatectomy or uh, surgery, what's in the mind of the doctor after? First of all, uh, if you have um, PSA sources, it might be cancer or it might also be a benign tissue because the prostate uh, is connected with the sphincter and with the bladder. When you do surgery, you want to have a, a, a patient that is going to uh, not uh, have incontinence, right? So you, you want to take care of that. So as I've said before, this might be caused by metastasis. After a surgery, the definition of a recurrence is when the PSA reaches 0.2. Sometimes you're going to detect PSA at point, uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, 0 0.05. And you won't be concerned. The definition of a recurrence is when the PSA level is over 0.2. Before that, it might be benign tissue, these little cells that are reminders at the site of the surgery. And so you're going to monitor them uh, before doing any treatment. After uh, radiation therapy, remember that it's there's still a prostate there. Uh, organ. There might be some benign tissue which was not irradiated that might be responsible of the elevation of PSA. There might also be some inflammation at the prostate. In the prostate, if you have a urinary infe infection, this might be a cause of an increase of PSA in the prost prostate. And so for somebody that was treated by radiation therapy, sometimes you have fake, uh, f false elevations of uh, PSA. And sometimes also there might be metastasis such as 
for a radical prostatectomy. Now, the definition of a recurrence after a radiation therapy is a little bit different from the one after a surgery because you still have some tissue, prostate tissue, and the definition is that increasing a PSA over 2 in relation to the lowest value, which is the nadir. One example, you have a patient which has a PSA of 8. You give a radiation therapy to the patient, and then the PSA falls to 0.5 during a year, and then it goes up again, 0.7, 1, 2, 2.5. And it's at 2.5 that you are going to uh, conclude that there is a recurrence after the radio radiation therapy. So there is a difference in these notions of recurrence after a radical prostatectomy and after radiation therapy. So why are we talking about all of these causes? The treatment, as mentioned before, between a local recurrence or at distance recurrence, some cells went elsewhere in the body, is going to be totally different after a radical prostatectomy. You're going to have uh, this rescue treatment. You want to look at these cells in the prostate. If there's a local recurrence, if it's at a distance, metastasis, you don't need to irradiate the prostate location. And so you're going to use uh, systemic systemic type of treatments. We've talked about these rescue treatments. What about for each of these first-line treatments? After a radical prostatectomy, the standard rescue treatment, and the only one is radiation external therapy rescue, uh, rescue radiation therapy, 33 treatments, which are given by external radiotherapy. You send uh, rays that are going to destroy these prostate cells, which are at the site of this radical prostatectomy, and also in these lymph nodes when the irradiation is uh, there. Now, the criteria to give this rescue um, radiation therapy is a biochemical recurrence. Uh, PSA over 2, but you don't want to do it too late. You want it to be very efficient, so you're going to give it before the PSA is under 0.5. Now, regarding radiation therapy, there are many uh, rescue therapies which are possible. There is this the rescue radical prostatectomy. You're going to do another surgery in the tissue. There's cryotherapy also, which means entering needles in the prostate and by freezing this tissue, preserving the urethra in order to destroy these recurrent cells. There are other therapies which use focal high intensity waves, which is called HIFU. This is another uh, therapy. And there are also experimental protocols which uh, include giving another dose of radiation therapy, which is radiation therapy in order to treat once again this prostate cancer. Now, these uh, rescue therapies are therapies which, according to me, are quite efficient, and you should always consider them if you have recurrence. Here are some curves of survival. Survival rates after five years here is 100% of survival after radiation therapy for a prostate cancer patient uh, treated with radical prostatectomy. So depending of some risk factors, you might have a very good uh, response, 90% here of response rate depending of these uh, PSA thresholds. Other uh, patient groups don't have a response which is as good. Here we have about 40% of response after five years, which means that when this is the less chance of being cured, it's important to consider uh, this avenue to have a rescue radiation therapy after surgery. So my fifth message is that this biochemical recurrence is not defined in the same way after a radical prostatectomy or a radiation therapy. So you can discuss with other people which had this. You cannot con uh, compare them very often. They are quite different. After a recurrence, after local treatment, there are rescue treatments which are available that should be considered because it's possible that you still might be cured. We're not talking about uh, 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 it's possible that you might be cured. It's possible that you will have a positive uh, response and that you will be cured. And my message number seven is that sometimes the PSA detection comes from metastasis. And in that case, these rescue treatments are not efficient. You treat locally, but you can have a PSA and prostate cancer that will still be evolving due to uh, these uh, cancerous cells that are going to be elsewhere in the body of the patient. Now, how can you predict if you have metastasis in the patient? There are two types of imaging, conventional imaging in hospitals, 
and there's molecular imaging. When you're talking about uh, conventional imaging, uh, which is uh, such as uh, x-rays, you're looking at the anatomy of the patient in the uh, lymph nodes, uh, in the uh, uh, bones. There's also nuclear medicine, which uses some radioactivity to uh, monitor cancer uh, and the impacts of cancer on anatomy. So conventional imaging, here we're talking about mostly uh, a CT scan. There's also um, uh, MRI uh, scan. Uh, IRM in French. So both of these imaging technologies, here you have this type of image that you get. So the first one, the CT scan, you're going to send some radiation, and then you're going to cut, so to speak, uh, the patient, and you are going to rebuild these cuts of the patient, and you're going to uh, recreate the anatomy of the patient uh, with all of its internal organs. Here you see, for instance, this white arrow, where there is a suspect lymph node. So you also have a nuclear magnetic resonance, which uses a different principle, which are magnetic changes in the body following a magnetic change. Uh, once interpreted, you will have the same types of information, which is an increase of the size of the lymph node, for instance, or other anomalies in the bone structures. Now, how do you diagnose these metastases in bones? As we know, prostate cancer, uh, metastases are present in bones 88% uh, of the time. The conventional exam is a bone scintillography. So how can that detect this uh, prostate cancer? So this is uh, isotopic bone scans. So they're going to use a bisphosphonate. This is going to be injected in the veins of the patient. And thanks to that, this agent is going to be binded to where the bone has been destructed and been uh, destroyed and reconstructed. It might be positive in case of fracture. But prostate cancer, getting into the bone is going to destroy the bone. So there's going to be this deconstruction, reconstruction process of the bone, and the isotopic bone scan will be able to detect these metastases in the bone. Now there's a new uh, type of imaging which has appeared uh, during the last 20 years. And regarding prostate cancer, uh, now it's been used for about five or seven years. This is molecular imaging. What is molecular imaging? In fact, it is the capacity of some molecules to bind with some proteins or genes which are in relation to cancer in vivo among patients. And these molecules, are, which are bind cancer in a specific way in patients, are going to be with a radioactive marker, uh, with more powerful markers than with isotopic bone scan. Then you expose the patient with a camera, which allows you to detect different thresholds of radioactivity, radiation. Here you see this arrow. Uh, this white arrow, and here in red you have a very hyperactive uh, area, and you have another intense area uh, in two locations. Now, knowing that this molecule that you call a tracer is related to uh, prostate cancer, well, there might be uh, prostate cancer in both of these locations. Then you take these images and you're going to uh, connect them to the anatomy, and then you see that this white arrow does correspond to a metastatic lymph node, even though this is a regular size, you can look if there are some cancerous cells, what is the probability rate of cancer. And also, you can see here that this red arrow corresponds to the gut. And because this tracer is in the gut, we know that it's not specific, therefore not a cancerous cell. Now, these uh, new imaging types of techniques are uh, very, very interesting now in order to find prostate cancer. Now, there are two tracers that we use during the last 10 years. The first one is choline. Choline is a tracer uh, which is in cell membranes. These are cells in all uh, mammals which are going to be incorporated when the cell divides. So it's going to be uh, more preferentially incorporated in cancer cells than in normal cells. So when you inject some choline in the patient, which is marked with fluoride or radioactive carbon, and you are going to use the PET scan, this type of imaging, you can see these hyper 
uh, bright, very bright areas when you're going to uh, use CT scans. And this gives you a very high probability of having a cancer in that location. Another type of tracer which is used today which is more and more uh, important now in the monitoring of recurrence of prostate cancer is the a tracer which is going to bind PSMA. What is PSMA? This is the prostate-specific membrane antigen. This is a protein which is uh, at the surface of cancerous cells mostly and not in benign tissue. So, and companies and different universities have been developing some tracers, that are markers that are going to be binding to these molecules. And these are radioactive uh, markers. And so this is a very specific type of imaging. It's like really uh, focusing on these cancerous cells uh, in a patient. And thanks to these markers or tracers, which have complicated names, these are markers that bind to these proteins. Therefore, you can detect these uh, lymph nodes, which might be cancerous, whereas uh, CD scans here to the left, here you have a little uh, lymph node, which was not suspect at all. Now, now this has uh, led the European Association of Urology, which is the uh, most important in the world right now, to give some recommendations. So who should uh, undergo that type of imaging or not uh, after uh, a radical prostatectomy or um, recurrence? And the same arguments might also be applied to radiation therapy, of course. So if uh, PSA is under one, no technique has been shown as be sensitive enough if to know if this is local recurrence or elsewhere in these metastases. If PSA is over one, uh, it's not re you can recommend to use uh, PET-CT scans uh, for coline or with uh, PSMI. Now, uh, listen to this. These new markers, tracers, are being uh, researched. They have not been uh, registered here in Canada yet. So the only way to have them is the only way to access them here right now is through research. It's the same thing as for like a medication. It needs to be approved here in Canada. And uh, in Europe, uh, the uh, rules are different. Uh, therefore, you cannot use them right now unless you are part of a research protocol. So just uh, get some information. There are some research been done here in Quebec, also in McGill and in Montreal. So these new markers or tracers are available, but only through research. Now, regarding conventional imaging, uh, whether it's uh, isotopic uh, bone scan or CT scan, it's recommended only if PSA is over 10. Why? Well, it's very, very sensitive. You will not find uh, metastasis at uh, PSA levels, uh, at thresholds, where it's going to influence the treatment, radiation therapy, or uh, rescue prostatectomy. So so what we have right now, our imaging uh, very often is not very efficient, not considered very efficient anymore, and molecular imaging will be uh, the new type of imaging that will be used. Now, another message, message number eight, if you have a recurrence of high-level prostate cancer, detection of metastasis might give a direction to the treatment, and now uh, the Conventional imaging techniques are not very good uh, to eliminate metastasis at uh, uh, PSA levels that allow for an efficient uh, rescue treatment. So in Quebec, we have to base our decisions and go to systemic treatments or local treatments based upon these PSA thresholds, the tumoral uh, levels, and Gleason uh, scores. So uh, we are going to give, therefore, a probability of answer uh, with the data we have in hand these stats uh, indicate that you're going to have 30% or 90% chances of uh, recurrence, let's say. So in the next few years, molecular imaging is going to uh, allow us to treat differently. You're going to say it's a local or you are at a distance if you have cancerous cells. And the chance of uh, positive treatment are going to be higher. Message number 10, there are new types of diagnosis using molecular imaging, using um, other uh, types of markers such as fluorocholine uh, or PSMA ligands. They are only available through research. Their role in clinics has not been established right now, but in just a few years, we are going to uh, work with 
these new molecules also in clinics. So now, so far, we have been talking about rescue uh, treatment and recurrence. And unfortunately, after some patients are going to still uh, progress in their disease, despite all of these treatment, the PSA level will still increase. So I wanted to mention this is a very difficult um, moment for patients. You were convinced that you could be cured, cured, but now you are getting into a new stage of the disease. Disease is evolving despite all of the treatment. At that stage, what I want to say is that we are not forced to react and treat right away. All right, we need to observe and we need to see the speed of the elevation of PSI. This might be a good indicator. We know that there are some treatments such as hormonal therapy. They might have some side effects. You might have to wait several years before patients are going to have metastasis are going to be detected by uh, conventional imaging. Some studies uh, have shown that regarding at least in six and seven cancers, really, uh, it might take several years before the biochemical recurrence and the uh, apparition of metastasis, uh, 10 or 8 years. And now, Gleason 6 and Boris, uh, we expect that the progression might be faster, but the m main message is not to wait for 8 years or 10 years, but we need to know that the observation period in order to understand the dynamic of the cancer, uh, is that appropriate? And we don't want to undergo treatment too early uh, with all its side effects, whereas we could have waited for many years before having some metastasis. And now, the cancer, when it has resisted to local treatment, uh, if it uh, exited this uh, prostate area, we're talking about metastasis, and then you need to start some systemic type of treatment, therefore, because there is, uh, there are metastases, and there are different types of systemic treatment at different stages of the disease. Now, the first treatment, which is the basics of prostate uh, treatment is castration. So why is castration such important treatment? Because the prostatic cells are going to use testosterone and male steroids. So without steroids, testosterone or hydrotestosterone cells are going to die or uh, not going to survive. So the first therapy, the basics of therapy to, con to control prostate cancer is to block these uh, types of substances. So what are the sources of testosterone? testes, the testes are the source, and also the adrenals, ad adrenal glands. These are these glands which are on the top of the uh, organs uh, which secrete some uh, adrenaline, and part of that is these substances might help the proliferation of cancer cells. So when you look at the basic treatment uh, that you can do in 2017, there are different uh, ones of them. First, you might target the testes. Either you remove by surgery the testes or you're going to have a chemical castration. So what uh, is this chemical castration? Uh, in order to secrete testosterone, testes need to be stimulated by some hormones uh, that are related to the pituitary gland, uh, LH, for instance, and will say, please secrete these hormones. And there are the antagonist, antagonists of uh, GnRH, which are going to block the secretion of LH, and therefore the testes are not going to secrete testosterone anymore. These are the osirilin and other substances, Permagon, Iligar, and all of these types of Zoladex, all of these uh, drugs that uh, involve chemical castration. You can also block in 2017 the action of the adrenals. This is something new uh, that since 2008, this is new with a pill called lateral acetate. And I'm going to explain its uh, mechanism of action. And you can also block directly the action mechanism of an androgens within the prostatic cells. Prostesterone uh, gets into the cell and will cell will say proliferate and this goes through a receptor. There's one molecule which accepts testosterone or androgen and will say tell the cell 
go. It's possible to replace this molecule that will bind to the receptor without activating it. So it will take the place. So these anti-androgens are the enzolitamin, for instance. These are active drugs to treat prostate cancer in a systemic way. So there are different ways to uh, use to control prostate cancer. Now, when a patient is sensitive to castration, was never exposed to andro uh, androgenes, what can you use? You can use the agonists and antagonists, balucalitamid or chemical castration. These are currently our options in 2018. Unfortunately, once a patient has been placed under hormonal therapy, here we're talking of some control of the disease. You cannot cure anymore. You can just monitor it because you want just to monitor the disease and you want to control it. And inevitably, it's going to become resistant to castration. This is yet another stage of the disease that will develop after some years of exposure to these uh, castrating uh, drugs. And then patients are going to become resistant to castration. They're going to develop metastases, which are visible with conventional imaging, and then you are going to give different types of treatment to uh, control the disease and then pain also and to make sure that the life will be longer for the patients. So when you are talking about the continuum of the disease, here we have explained when the patient has a recurrence after uh, local treatment, you can start hormonal therapy and PSA will be controlled. But after a while, a few years, you're going to see the level of PSA going up and the patient might become non uh, metastatic according to conventional imaging and that you might detect the metastasis and it is with this detection of metastasis that you might consider other types of agents which are going to control the disease and also prolong the life of the patient. Regarding uh, cancers that don't have any metastasis, you have a patient uh, who is resistant to castration. So when you do the isotopic bone scan and CT scan, you don't find any metastasis. What can you do right now? There's no acknowledged treatment to prolong life. What you know is that in 2018, there might be some announcements, news. There are large studies that were done which are going to announce some benefit uh, due to some uh, drugs, molecules. Right now, there's only research which is being done. We don't have much to offer to patients. This is quite stressing. We are going to wait to see the occurrence of metastasis before offering treatment. The first treatment, which is uh, efficient for prostate cancer, here we're talking about uh, metastatic conditions resistant to castration. So there are metastases. The first treatment, which has been shown as efficient, is uh, chemotherapy. Uh, so the first study that shown an efficient molecule for prostate cancer with metastasis, uh, this has shown that uh, chemotherapy can prolong the life of 2.5 months, the survival of patients in average. So we have a survival rate of uh, in the, the dash line is chemotherapy, which is acknowledged as being good in order to increase or reduce rather the pain, but not increase the survival rate. Regarding this uh, chemotherapy, we see that the patients with chemotherapy will uh, live longer. And now here we have some new options for prostate cancer uh, with metastasis resistant to castration. Then there were other hormones that have appeared during the years 2008 and 10. And these are labirateron acetate and ensomitamine. Now, labirateron acetate is a pill that you can have which is going to act on the adrenals when cancer, prostate cancer, is proliferating again after castration. You can block these enzymes. You are going to block the secretion of these androgens by the adrenals, and then the prostate cancer will, don't, will not have enough uh, of these uh, hormones and will stagnate and then you're going to control the disease for some time. So this is a molecule which is quite efficacious to treat uh, prostate cancer with uh, metastasis. This increases survival, decreases pain, and there are many uh, advantages according to the studies. Another molecule which is also going to act on androgens but not the same mechanism is the enzalitamine, which is also extending as well. So enzalitamine is a super an androgen and there is a receptor of androgens which uh, welcomes uh, binds to, 
testosterone and will tell the cell, uh, create other cells and uh, so this binding is going to be blocked and will prevent the cell from having uh, positive silos following the exposure to testosterone and, and, and androgenone. And so this molecule, which increases the survival of patients regarding uh, compared to placebos, this also has shown that it um, increases the life quality of life of the patients always when you have a metastasis with uh, castration resistance. So when you have a patient which is metastatic, with, uh, which is also castration resistant. Now, what happens when the patient uh, progresses, but after its uh, docetaxel chemotherapy? There are always some options, again, which have been studied. There is the aviroterone acetate and talizone. And there's another type of chemotherapy as well, which is even more powerful, which is the cabazitaxel, which is different to uh, you can also give anzalutamid, and you can also give some type of what we call radionuclide therapy, which is a therapy which is based upon radiation, which is radium-223. Now, what is uh, this radium-223? How can such a therapy based on radiation, how can it control some cancer which is all over the body? Now, radium, as you know, is an al analog of calcium. In fact, it is some atom which has the same properties as calcium. It's going to bind where calcium binds. We all know, and we were told that we should drink milk. It's good for the bones. How come our bones are uh, extremely strong? It is because there is some calcification proteins uh, calcified due to calcium. And the radium has this property to be binded in the same location as calcium. However, radium is radioactive. It will disintegrate and will send some particles called these alpha particles, which are very toxic for cells. So in order to do some analogy with uh, uh, isotopic bone scan, uh, there's going to be some captation where the uh, bone is going to regenerate, be destructed and regenerate. There's calcium all the time involved. And calcium is going to go in these locations. However, instead of staying there, uh, it's going to disintegrate and it's going to attack the cancerous cells. This is what we have here in this illustration, where there is a change of bone. Radium, just like calcium, is going to get into these locations where there is bone change and will attack cancerous cells in order to destroy them. And of course, radium works if there's no metastasis elsewhere in uh, lymph nodes, and so the indications of this molecule are mostly after a chemotherapy or for patients that are not eligible, which have some bone metastasis. And this molecule, as you, as we have seen, is going to increase the survival rate as other drugs and will also decrease the pain of patients if there are pains uh, because of these bone metastases. This is part of the therapy, which is very different from other ways. The other agent is the cabazitaxel. This is a uh, chemical for therapy after docetaxel, which is also going to increase the survival rate of the cohort after one treatment with, of docetaxel. So where are we at in 2017 in our therapies for patients, which has metastasis that was castrated, which had a recurrence, a, a patient uh, f that should be treated, and we have five options. Ideally, we would like to try them one after the other among the patients. So there are some molecules that are going to target the androgen ways in a more powerful way than uh, just castration, abiraterol and anulimid. Other agents were going to target other ways in cells, such as cabazitaxel and docetaxel, which are chemotherapies, and also radium-223, which is an agent that uh, targets the bones and that will target these uh, bone metastases mostly. Now, another illustration here of the uh, certified uh, treatments in Canada for prostate cancer. This is just as a reference for you and for others that will uh, want to see this conference once again later. This gives you the range of possibilities of different uh, drugs for metastatic uh, prostate cancer uh, after castration. My second message is that the new treatment for this type of cancer has allowed to increase the survival rate 
of patients of several months and several years. When you look at the uh, Ocitec cell first study for these um, patients resistant to castration, the survival rate was 18 months. And the latest studies that were made with bilateron and abilitamid, now we're talking about a survival rate of 35 months. A gain was made, and so so we should keep having hope, and there are new drugs which are being developed now, and we have more and more indications about them. A another component of the recurrence of this cancer when it becomes resistant to castration is prevention of bone complications. Why? Prostate cancer, as I was saying, 85% of the patients with metastasis are going to have bone metastasis when they are resistant to castration. And these bone metastases are going to create all types of complications. They might create fractures or pain or might compress the um, center of the spine and this is going to compress that area so there are all types of complications that might occur and this has some major uh, impacts pain loss of autonomy also a reduction of life quality of life and also an increase of cost uh, because uh, it costs a lot to uh, uh, do the surgeries. So we want to prevent these bone complications when you have these types of conditions. And there are two molecules, which are acid silotonic and dolinodal, which are now administered uh, at once with all of the previous agents, such as parilateron and all the other drugs which were mentioned before, which can be administered not and uh, not to increase the uh, survival rate, but to prevent the complications and progression of the disease. So these drugs should be considered if you have this type of cancer in order to reduce what we call the morbidity and the uh, side effects of these uh, bone conditions. So we should consider these bone conditions that happen after the progression of uh, prostate cancer. And also, you should try to prevent them by giving the right medication that are going that's going to decrease these events. And according to these uh, studies, we have these drugs that are going to prevent bone complication, and they are available in Canada. There are two points. I know that this is a long conference. We started f from recurrence at recurrence. Now we are at um, castration-resistant uh, cancer and so many things. But I still wanted to mention two uh, novelties, yes, two novelties in the literature and also uh, in the way we manage these uh, recurrent prostate cancer. The first one was announced this year in 2017, and we realized that whenever we have prostate cancer, which is recurrent after surgery, and we give radiation therapy, rescue therapy, there's a subgroup of patients. If you give hormonal therapy uh, after six months or two years, you're going to reduce the mortality rate. So uh, you can use hormonal therapy earlier now and not wait for metastasis. You can give this with uh, radiation therapy, hoping that uh, you might be cured, so a combination of both. So if you have prostate cancer with recurrence and for which you consider that you have you might consider radiation therapy. You can discuss about the benefit of having a hormonal therapy as well. So here we have several curves. So it doesn't tell you much, but let me tell you that this is survival without progression. And you see that in red, the patients which have received hormonal therapy also compared to those that didn't get the treatment. And also here, the global survival rate of a subgroup of patients, those that had uh, PSA over 1.5 before radiation treatment, hormonal therapy versus those that didn't get hormonal therapy. So this is a new data uh, in the case of recurrence. Another novelty, which is not as new, which uh, dates back from two years ago, but I think that it's important to mention if you are interested in the recurrence of prostate cancer, you need to be aware. Whenever you start this hormonal therapy as first-line treatment, when you have a patient with metastasis, you should consider now chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy at that location. So we were talking that chemotherapy was kept for uh, uh, prostate cancer resisting uh, at castration. But now, whenever you initiate the treatment, uh, you can also get some benefits with uh, some chemotherapy. And the benefit of that chemotherapy is very important. We are talking about 
an increased survival rate of 13.6 percent those that got it compared to those that didn't get it so really uh, again if somebody unfortunately has a prostate cancer with metastasis and if you recommend to start the hormonal therapy you need to have a discussion with your doctor with your specialist about the possibility of getting some chemotherapy and we're talking about one additional year of survival so my message number 14 is that the addition of hormonal therapy might increase the survival rate uh, of the patients as well uh, and if you have this diagnosis you need to discuss with your doctor and in parallel the addition of a chemotherapy might add significantly the survival rate of patients uh, so uh, you might think about hormonal therapy and with that diagnosis you might think about your doctor about getting also some uh, chemotherapy thank you so much for your patience thank you so much for your attention